Okay, um, welcome to this talk by the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. My name is Georg Gange and I will be today's moderator. Um, today's speaker is Wolf Kansteiner with the topic um, Meta Holocaust, a multi directional theory of history. Um, Wolf is a historian by trade and he is currently professor at the Department of History and Classical Studies at Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, you probably know that, but his main uh, re research interests lie in um, memory studies, um, Holocaust history, and post narrativist theory and philosophy of history. Um, I don't think that Wolf needs much introduction beyond this in, in our circles here. He's a very renowned scholar in the theory and philosophy of history, and he's probably one of the uh, most well known scholars worldwide in memory studies. Um, the same goes for Wolf's many um, papers, publications, and books, I think. Therefore, I just want to mention one text here that's a bit older that might not come to your mind immediately um, when you think of Wolf, and I will tell you why I mentioned this paper. The paper for, is um, from 1993, and the title is Hayden White's Critique of the Writing of History. And why do I mention this paper? This is one of the first papers I ever read in the philosophy of history, and it was one of the papers, I mean, I had an interest before that sort of got me hooked to it. I then also used it in a master thesis extensively that I wrote on a similar topic. Um, and now I haven't read that paper in a while, but I do remember it still as a very interesting and good and worthwhile paper. So um, what I want to say with this, I guess, is if you haven't looked at Wolf's older texts recently, more, maybe you're only from more familiar with what he more recently have done, I would invite you too to look at his texts that are, I think, like this one, 25 years old, or maybe a bit older even. Um, now, we are very happy to have Wolf here in online presence, but um, Wolf will also be with us in presence next month in Oulu at the Center for Philosophy and Studies of History. He will be a visiting scholar for one week. Um, there are many events planned with him for that time. Uh, at the moment, I only want to mention one of them. Um, Wolf will give the first annual uh, Eudaimonia lecture on the um, human sciences, and the topic will be responsible for getting democracy, free speech, and cosmopolitan memory. So that, this will be a lecture about memory. I'm not sure how much memory will be part of today, but there will be about memory. And it will be on the 19th of May and um, 6 p.m. finish time, and it will be recorded, and it might also be live streamed. We'll see about that. But check our homepage of social media to update on this. Um, this is our third session, our spring seminar. After today, we will have one more session in May. In May, uh, we will have Karla Pichleinen from us, from the center, from the University of Oulu, speaking about history and history and parahistory. This will be the uh, Thursday, the 26th of May, at the same time, our 4 p.m. Um, <clears throat> then our seminar will go on a summer break and we will come back in autumn. However, that's not the last event before the summer of the center. And um, we will have in June still the a workshop in Oulu. The workshop is called uh, The Future of Philosophy of History. Mm. We'll be on the 9th and 10th of June. We have invited eight scholars to come to Oulu with us and discuss this. Um, had already had to be postponed twice already, unfortunately, due to COVID, but now it looks like it's going to happen. Um, and the program will soon be online, and this event will also be um, recorded, and this, that event will also be live streamed, so you can follow it also live, the, um, the workshop on the future of philosophy of history. And for all this, um, I suggest you best follow our social media, Twitter and Facebook, they will be updated in a very timely fashion about our events. Um, but uh, even beyond that, our homepage is also always uh, worth a visit. Now, finally, technicalities before I eventually finally give the word to Wolf. Um, please mute yourself during the talk to avoid unnecessary disturbance. And um, after Wolf's talk, there will be a discussion session, which I will be moderating. I'm um, in discussion session. Um, I will make a speaker's list. Um, please indicate first to in the chat if you have, want to say something. When it's your turn, you can either speak up with your camera on or off, or um, you can write in the chat and I will read it out. Um, and we'll prioritize people who have not spoken yet, so they will move up on the speaker's list. So um, that was it from my side. Thank you very much for um, accepting our invitation. Wolf and the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Uh, first, I, I thank you very much for the invitation, Georg and, and Joni Mati. I, I'm much looking forward. It's a great, uh, nice coincidence because I think many of the ideas that I'm trying to develop, uh, they, they, they should fit quite nicely with ideas that also have purchase in, in your group. And uh, as you said, I'm a memory studies expert and very active in that field. So I try to um, be also, try to keep abreast uh, in philosophy of history and historical theory. Let's see how, how successfully I've, I've managed to do that. Um, I will now share my screen if that's uh, okay and share my...
then afterwards my PowerPoint. Tell me if you tell me if you can see uh, the presentation. Yes. Perfect. Looks good. very good. Okay, well, this is uh, just uh, my home turf building here. I'm starting, I'm starting, I'm jumping right into it. I think we are now in a very interesting situation um, that we have uh, three uh, philosophies of history that are now ro robust enough that we can compare them. That wasn't the case for the longest time. For the longest time, we had more or less two, I would argue. Um, in Joni Matti's uh, vocabulary, that's the pre-narrativist and the narrativist, and not uh, least of all thanks to him. Uh, I think we have now robust choices. Uh, and the three choices are, and you might be very familiar with them, of course, is the first idea of um, a kind of correspondence between historical writing, professional historical writing and the past. That idea, that understanding is more or less the understanding that many historians have of their own work, at least as a kind of uh, ideal. I try to immediately correlate and put together this idea of a correspondence between past reality and present writing by uh, aligning it with a specific text type. You will see why I do this. I would argue correspondence is particularly uh, relying on the text type of description. We'll come back to that. The next alternative is the, the one that uh, we have already mentioned so frequently and is so often uh, linked to the name of Hayden White. That is the very idea that professional historical writing is not so much a task of a description. That's part of it. But much more important are the aesthetic and ideological experience that professional historical writing provides through the fact that it is always engaged in uh, narrativizing and in narration. So, uh, so this second alternative, of course, uh, has very, very different claims and uh, a very different perspective on professional historical writing, arguing that factuality is, is not the key accomplishment. The key accomplishment is to narrate, to provide orientation, to provide an experience, um, an aesthetic experience, and to open venues of uh, ideological identity. Um, that I would say, of course, is uh, uh, the realization of the linguistic turn in historical theory. And then the last one, a very interesting one, uh, also an interdisciplinary insight uh, from different points uh, of view, different points of the academic world, is the idea that uh, professional historical writing actually doesn't serve primarily the purpose of catching the past, corresponding to past reality. And it doesn't primarily serve the purpose of offering entertaining uh, narration. What it actually is, it's most of the time professional historical writing are pieces of argumentation. So this is, these are professionals um, making suggestions about a specific topic and then trying to provide a, a compelling argumentative structure, lining up their arguments in order to convince the audience of a given proposition. That might be that might have uh, that might be an, an, an argument pertaining to politics. It might be an argument pertaining to causality. It might be an argument that is pitching different professional historians against each other. It might be an argument that has a wider uh, interdisciplinary reach, as the case may be. But argumentation is the focus, and that's that's the post narrativist uh, position. So these are the three positions, and I think. We are now in a, in, a, in, a, in a lucky situation that we have these alternatives and we can start playing with them. And we have more than, than the two that existed, uh, I would say, until relatively recently. Now, just to give some names uh, to these different positions, um, I would argue one of the most determined defender of the correspondence uh, theory, trying to develop the correspondence theory into uh, an, a philosophy of history, uh, was uh, B.N. McCulloch, uh, 
um, he certainly believes in the idea of descriptive uh, uh, truth, trying to respond, trying to respond with an empiricist uh, argument to the linguistic term. Yes, uh, I think one of the two most important publications uh, in my view. Uh, again, you know, putting a, putting a name and uh, a very famous publication and a very famous page to our second perspective, that is the narrativist uh, perspective. Here we have uh, Hayden White with his famous structuralist system. Um, it's very interesting here to highlight immediately that the system already includes the category of argument. Uh, I would, however, suggest that for Hayden, argument, the arguments that he identified were different types of arguments, the way that the text advances different types of arguments. He was not creating some kind of hierarchy, and he was not uh, therefore suggesting uh, to differentiate between better or worse arguments. And, and I think that's maybe one of the decisive differences to the next approach. Now, first a footnote here, I, I allowed myself to, to add a footnote as we were talking about Hayden. Um, here, that's uh, my, my also connection uh, as, a, as a scholar, my autobiographical connection to this topic. I was um, a res Saul Friedlander's research assistant in 1990, as we staged that uh, famous conference probing the limits of representation designed precisely to test um, Hayden White's idea, ideas in the field of Holocaust uh, history. And the idea was, you know, this, the, the alleged relativism uh, of Hayden White that was uh, perceived to be part of his theory. How can that be handled in the uh, ethically so loaded field of Holocaust uh, history? And uh, I think what's intriguing is also to remember some of the other protagonists of that conference, because other than Saul Friedland and Hayden White, there was also very importantly present Carlo Ginsburg, um, Perry Anderson, and another person one really shouldn't forget uh, in, in, the, uh, in historical theory, that is uh, Sandy Cohen. In, in my experience, also in my reading experience, is still one of the most challenging uh, theorists when it comes to trying to understand professional historical writing. If you wish, we can return uh, to this uh, autobiographical footnote in our discussions later. Now, um, and now the last one uh, linked to uh, our host, in my perception, an, an absolutely exciting book, A Post-Narrativist Philosophy of History is a book that I make my students read. Um, hopefully most of them survive it without too much uh, uh, trauma, uh, but they remember the book also semesters after uh, they have read it first. What I find so interesting here is that it provides a new perspective, a perspective that has been uh, reflected and developed by other professionals who try to understand how history functions. But what I find so refreshing are two points that I would like to highlight. The first point is to argue in agreement uh, with the narrativists um, that key tasks of what professional historians accomplish are not directly linked to the facts of history. Historians have to get their facts straight, that's part of their work, but that's often uh, just when their work begins. So that insight, post-narrativists and narrativists share in my perception, but at the same time, in agreement um, with the, the with a narrative in disagreement with the narrativists to also suggest that a key function of historical writing might not be cannot be proven as facts, that is, the larger conceptual schemes, but they can be assessed in terms of their quality. And we can differentiate between more or less successful um, historical writing. And we can develop criteria for trying to assess uh, these different concepts. We come back to that. It's the a famous idea of colligatory concepts that has, you know, long history in the philosophy of history. But I think um, this idea that professional history is about providing compelling arguments and that the structure, 
And the relation between these arguments and the empirical foundation that is marshaled for these arguments, that these relationships can be assessed according to their suitability, their, their, their integrity. Uh, I think that is a new idea, and that's a very fruitful idea because it opens up new perspective and it also moves the theory of history beyond the deadlock between the pre-narrativists and the narrativists uh, who didn't see much uh, common ground, I would argue, in the last, um, yeah, last almost 50 years. Now we come back to these questions and also to these uh, criteria. I find them absolutely intriguing. As I said here, I, I, I uh, refer to what I find, maybe if I have to decide one of the most important pages in, post, in the post-narrativist philosophy of historiography. But uh, let's uh, move on. Another footnote here. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that this idea that uh, professional historical writing is not about narrative. That's not, narrative is part of it. It's present everywhere, but that's not the task. That's not the essential task of historians. That idea was not uh, for the first time developed by post narrativists. It already was quite present uh, in the writing of narratologists. And I would say most prominently in the work of Monika Fludanik, uh, one of the most important um, living narratologists. And she argued in her introduction to narratology, for example, that from her point of view as a narratologist, professional historical writing is simply not something that she sees at her task to analyze because professional historical writing is about argumentation. It's not about narration. Narration is there uh, as the means, a tool to uh, accomplish more effective uh, arguments, to craft more effective arguments. So, so this idea um, that his professional historical writing is focused on argumentation and not narration as an end in itself, or maybe the decisive end, uh, the decisive purpose of professional historical writing. That's an idea echoed also by a narratologist, often in, in, the, in, the, more in the margins of their writing, precisely because they are convinced this is not their task. Their task is not to try to understand professional historical writing. We can disagree with that, but I find the idea is so interesting um, that here you have that important disagreement. So we're looking at what I would say is a triangle, a very intriguing triangle, which again, I would like to link, and I go into more depth in, an, in a moment, uh, which I would link to, the to three fundamentally different textual modes. That is the mode of description for the idea that historic, professional historical writing corresponds to past reality, the text mode of narration to the idea that professional historical writing is first and foremost concerned with uh, crafting good narratives, compelling narratives, intriguing narratives, entertaining narratives. And the, finally, the position um, that professional historical writing primarily serves the purpose of developing compelling arguments um, and therefore can be assessed, for example, by the criteria of, let's say, informal logic. That might perhaps be uh, the criteria that would uh, be, that allow us to uh, assess the success or failure of professional historical writing. So this is a, the, the kind of a triangular space and, and uh, we will return uh, to that triangle in a moment because I would also argue in that triangle, we can place almost all philosophers of history and all uh, th theorists of history. They are somewhere here, more or less convinced, more or less positioned themselves. And, and it could be an extremely ent entertaining game uh, for example, one played at an INTH uh, conference. Where do these people belong? Where does the early Angersmith belong? Where does the late Angersmith belong? Where is John Roth? Uh, where is Sandy Cohen? Uh, so uh, where is Jörn Ruysen? I think we can, can, which mode of um, textual advancement, which mode, which purpose of history 
do these different theorists favor? And I would say most people can be placed somewhere uh, in this triangle. If you read their works and some people have changed their position quite uh, significantly in the course of their careers. Now I'd like to, uh, as a metaphor, you know, uh, metaphors I think uh, are important in history. Uh, maybe they should also be important in the theory of history. I like a metaphor. I like, I like the metaphor here of a bridge. So if I look at a, at a bridge as a construction, then looking at the bridge through the lenses of the pre-narrativists, the empiricists, the people who are fans of the correspondence uh, assumption, they look at the bridge and they see a continuously structured building. Uh, where the uh, the parts on top are dependent on the parts of the, uh, at the are dependent on the bottom. Everything is is nicely built on top of each other. It's a continuous structure. There is no difference, and the continuous structure follows the same rules. Which means the top of the structure has the same epistemological integrity as the bottom of the structure. They are dependent on each other and they're consistently structured. Now, the narrativists, which I have now placed nicely on this uh, red part, the, the narrative trajectory, let's say, uh, of a text here of my bridge metaphor, they see a completely different phenomenon. They see a completely different object. Because for narrativists, there is a decisive qualitative difference between the, the structure, the below, the foundation of the bridge, and the narrative trajectory that is on top. Because for narrativists, there is no causal relationship between the two very often. You can use the same uh, facts, the same building blocks and build completely different narratives. There is no, there is a, di a decisive change in the construction principle between the base and the superstructure. So, so if you wish, for narrativists, the bridge is floating. The bridge is floating in air, in midair. It is actually not dependent on the facts that are below it. So the decisive change in quality, the decisive change in construction principle, that's what they see when they sit on the bridge. And the post-narrativists, I think have a very new and interesting perspective. They look at this construction more kind of top down, I would say, maybe even hovering above. And they see two things. They see indeed a qualitative change between the base and the superstructure. But uh, they also see that the structure of the bridge, independent of its narrative trajectory, can be assessed as to its integrity, as to its quality, as to its compellingness. So that sense, uh, in that sense, it's a new perspective, a perspective that acknowledges the, sh the shifting gears between base and superstructure, different construction principles, but at the same time would argue both of these parts of the bridge, the base and the superstructure, follow or should follow ideally the rules of logic. They are not uh, always a questions of, for example, aesthetic or ideological preference, as the narrativists would assume for the narrative trajectory. So this is my, so this is my metaphor. We, maybe we can return to it to try to understand uh, the, the three different perspectives. Now, here I would like to introduce uh, an, an, um, a kind of ground zero to render these uh, three terms uh, more concrete and try to have a definition hopefully not strictly metaphorical, a definition of what precisely is narration, what dis precisely is description, and what precisely is argument. If we start, and I, I'm referring here to the, from my perspective, very interesting work of the text linguist uh, Carlotta Smith. Uh, she's diseased, but she was a, a very productive and very, uh, I think, uh, successful um, text linguist at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, now, in her, in her book, she has many insights, um, but uh, I want to zoom in on these three text types. The first one is description, where she argues 
you look at description, descriptive paragraphs, descriptive sentences, then you can see they are advancing spatially. So, uh, so the perfect example for, exa for, for a description would be a travel, travel writing. There is narrative in it, can very well be narrative in it, but often the idea is to explore a space. So it's the spatial advancement. The text advances spatially, as she would say, and it's, it's the primacy of spatial advancement that is specific to description. Now, narration, as she, as so many other people have argued, narration progresses through time. So narration progresses uh, as time advances. Narration is one of the few text types we have and the most important one we have to represent time. So that means if you're looking at a text that primarily advances through time, then that would be a narration. And this primarily, that's I think an intriguing question. Now, finally, a little more complicated, her suggestions about argument are that argument advances by motion, what she calls through metaphorical space. That can be rendered much more concrete, easily much more concrete. What uh, Smith argues is advancement through metaphorical space means there's a topic, for example, the state of American democracy. And then there's a proposition. American democracy is in danger. And then there are a couple of arguments why American democracy is in danger. So, so this metaphorical space that is being explored is, for example, the topic of American democracy. And then you have a list of arguments. And the, the, again, the structure here can be assessed by the categories and the criteria of informal logic. So this, this gives us an idea and raises, I would argue, intriguing questions. But first of all, this is text linguistics at a base level, at a level of sentences, at a level of paragraphs. Um, and the question is, can one, how does one apply that to whole books? You know, how one, it raises the intriguing question, uh, are there perhaps, as I would argue, very different types of history? Professional history as a vast field is not just producing one type of history. I would suggest as my hypothesis, there are at least three essentially and drastically different types of history. There's a professional historical writing that indeed advances spatially, where the idea of describing space um, is more important than the others, than the other, than the other uh, types of advancements. And then there's history um, that advances through narration, where it's indeed the first task of the text is to narrate, is to represent time and movement through time, complex movements uh, through time. And finally, there's also professional history that is primarily designed to advance an argument. And here the text would be, I would, I would suggest, and we can also show this, is primarily designed to move through what Carlotta calls metaphorical space. Like for example, um, the state of American democracy. So this is my attempt to give our, our abstract terms a, a kind of a, a, a more solid uh, a base and see if we can apply this to, to longer texts and if, if that's, uh, that's possible, to what extent that might be possible. Oh, uh, they, sh they should have, uh, I will return to this one. Maybe, I, maybe it's too early to already show it now. What I will do in the end, if I, when I move to case studies, I want to place historians. So let's return to this later. I don't wanna, that's part of, more like part of my conclusion. Um, so the idea here is as a hypothesis, uh, what I would like to shift, uh, the, the small contribution I would want to make to the discussions about historical theory is that I see in these three schools, big schools, pre-narrativists, narrativists, post-narrativists, post I see a tendency uh, to highlight, to emphasize that history follows one of these modes of advancement. Um, it is either description or it is um, 
it is narration or it's, it's argument. And, and I want to suggest, and that can also be already shown in many of the writings on the philosophy of history, but I would suggest we have to perhaps emphasize even more than we used before the multidirectionality. That is that historians are actually in the beautiful position that they can play with these different text types, with these different modes of advancement, and they can play with them to different ends. And I want, I, want to, I want to suggest that in many cases, if we're looking at a concrete book, at a concrete publication, a concrete article, we can actually identify its primary, its primary mode of advancement. Um, the other modes are always present. History is always a hybrid undertaking. All the modes of advancement are developed. But the question is, what is the primary mode of advancement? And why is this so important? It's so important because I would suggest that books with different primary modes of advancement, be that description as correspondence, be that narration as aesthetic experience, be that argumentation as to, in terms of a compelling intervention, that these books should perhaps first and foremost be assessed by different criteria. So, the same size doesn't fit all. The same criteria doesn't fit all. There are books that don't really want to argue, right? Um, maybe um, the standards of, of informal logic are not the criteria we would use to assess them. So, so I would suggest that as a point of departure, we try to assess the books by their primary mode of advancement. And I would suggest that there are in the vast field of professional historical writing, fundamentally different types of texts. Good. And, and another little footnote here, um, I, I, I find it uh, productive to think about the way that texts are structured uh, in the same way as narratologists think about how narratives are structured. Because in narratology, I find one of the most intriguing entities is that of the narrator that the text implicit vantage point, the text implicit actor, you could say, uh, that holds the reins and puts together, uh, you know, how a narrative is developed, where the turning points are, where it begins, where it ends, uh, what figures uh, play an important role, how causality is structured, and all of these, uh, these entities that a narrator does as an intrinsic part of the story. Now, in the case of professional historical writing, uh, I would uh, want to, to suggest that we cannot call that entity, that uh, text internal uh, actor, uh, we cannot call that figure a narrator uh, because there are historical writings that are not primarily narratives that serve other purposes. And therefore, I'm trying to suggest and integrate, introduce the, the category of the texter. I, maybe I can come up with some more elegant uh, version. But the texter's uh, uh, task is also to compose the relationship and integrate the relationship between description, narration, and argumentation. And for example, also uh, to decide uh, what is the primary mode of advancement of a given book of history, right? So therefore, not narrator, but texter. Other than that, the entity is very similar to what you find in uh, classical uh, narratology. Good. Uh, so the multidirectionality here means that, you know, you have, you have uh, it's, a, uh, it's a hybrid uh, phenomenon, all three types of advancements, the fundamental ones, and maybe also others, uh, are always present, um, but they are they play a more more uh, important or less important role, uh, and this is what I try to summarize here. So you have, I would suggest, professional historical texts that are primarily uh, cast in the mode of description. They use narration and argumentation, but they use it for the purpose of describing. Then you have a fundamentally different type. You have uh, professional texts of history that are primarily concerned with and want to uh, represent change over time in terms of 
compelling, in terms of interesting, in terms of entertaining uh, narratives. And they use the modes of description and the modes of argumentation to advance the task of narration. And then you have also, and more recently even more, I would argue, you have um, texts that are primarily concerned with developing a compelling argument, and they use description and narration for the purpose of developing compelling arguments. And I think if you look closely at professional historical writing, at the text, at the books, at the deduction, conclusions in between, you can actually determine the primary mode of advancement, the primary purpose. I would argue with the figure of the texter, that primary mode of advancement is written into the text. Now, the text can be perceived from different angles. The text can have a reception history where people emphasize its descriptive uh, accomplishments, and then others emphasize its narrative accomplishments. And a third group maybe is happy with the arguments that are uh, um, delivered. But I would argue written into the text is actually looking at the text also from its the context of its origin is a primary mode of how the text is supposed to be read. So, so there is not just, um, in that sense, uh, a, a texter inside the text. There's also an implicit reader. And so the, the, one of the interesting tasks become, is now to try to, to figure out what precisely is the relationship between different advancements in complex historical writing. What type of history do we have here? And how should we assess it properly? Now, in, in, for me, uh, the field that I'm now trying to apply this to is Holocaust uh, historiography. So the professional, professional uh, historical writing about the history of the Holocaust, a very specific field and one that's often used to test historical theory. That was precisely one of the things that happened in probing the limits of representation. Um, you know, and, and what I would, so, so the task now is a seemingly a very complex and very complicated task is to try to use these text linguistic insights that are developed on a, on a very uh, a low level of textual complexity, sentences and, and, and paragraphs to try to apply them uh, to whole books. How do we do this? And I suggest a shortcut. And the shortcut is to try to understand the, the quality, the trajectory of the key colligatory concepts in uh, 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 a given um, histor historical text. So, so to use colligation and the key task of colligation as a first hint, as an idea to form a hypothesis about a given text. So if colligation seems to be heavily invested in description, we might have one of those texts that is invested in description first and foremost. If the text, uh, if the uh, colligatory concept, uh, the key colligatory concept suggests this is uh, very much invested in narration, then as a hypothesis, why not take that serious and look at the text as a narrative? And of course, the same applying to argumentation. And of course, this is always only a decision one can make with regard also to the relationship of the book and its context, the context within it's within its, where it's published. Now I'm, I'm using here uh, uh, some of the key uh, uh, colligatory concepts in the books that I would like to refer to by way of a hypothesis. We won't be able to prove uh, all the details, but we can, we can at least try to develop hypotheses and maybe also at a later point in time, test them. One of the uh, books I'm referring to is Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands, where I would argue Bloodlands is itself one of the key colligatory concepts. The question now is, interesting question, what type of, of colligatory concept is it? What type of book is Bloodlands? Description, narrative, argument, what is it? What's the key? Um, another one is uh, Friedlander's uh, colligatory concept of redemptive anti-Semitism. What type of concept is that? Sounds more narrative, a little more narrative perhaps than Bloodlands. Uh, then another key, a uh, concept in Friedlander is that of uh, interpretive unease um, that he introduces on a different level. Uh, I'm also would re be referring to one of Raoul Hilberg's key concepts, the one of machinery of destruction. And the final example is from Christopher Browning's work from 2004, uh, The Euphoria of Victory. <laughs> 
So what I want to do now is I want to play a little bit with some of the books, develop some arguments about these books and try to test this idea if one can actually say there are different types of histories. Are there in the field of Holocaust history fundamentally different types of professional historical texts? You know? And I hope uh, at least in part I, I can uh, convince uh, the audience here. So let's look at some of these texts. This one is the classic, The Destruction of European Jews by Raoul Hilberg in, in three versions. The structure never changed. The book just got bigger and bigger. Uh, I would argue that the destruction of European Jews is actually first and foremost concerned with description. And that might surprise because there are some very powerful statements. There are some powerful arguments. There are powerful interventions uh, in that book. And they're also powerful metaphors that he uses. But I would suggest they are tangential to the main undertaking of the book. Of course, there are key arguments in this underlying that descriptive um, work of Raoul Hilberg, massive work of Raoul Hilberg. Uh, and the key argument is this happened. The Holocaust happened and it's relevant. No, because that was, of course, not the case when he wrote the book, when he started in 1916, his dissertation in the 1950s. Nobody took this topic seriously. His advisors told him, this is the end of your career. Nobody, we know everything that needs to be known uh, about um, the end lösung, the final solution. And he wrote this book to compel, to argue, this is important, this happened. It is relevant. But... It's nevertheless, in the most part, a very descriptive book. It's a book that advances spatially. And I think many of the arguments that were raised about the book also after its publication are not what the book is about. So for example, the arguments that filled so much space uh, in the 1960s was the argument about Raoul Hilberg's assessment of the Jewish leadership during the Holocaust, uh, where he has been criticized for blaming the victims. Well, Hilberg had a very, very negative uh, view of the, the leadership of the European Jews in that sense that they did not uh, mount any kind of resistance and that they became complicit in the final solution. <clears throat> That's an argument that has, uh, has certainly different assessments for that. But if you look at the book, those assessments that he does deliver with, with biting sarcasm, they are not the key uh, objective of the book. The key objective of the book to show how it happened, to move across Europe from one space to the other, to deliver a kind of chronology of the catastrophe in very different uh, spaces across Europe. Another uh, element of the book that's figurative in nature and has also attracted a lot of attention is the machine metaphor that he uses, the, describing the final solution as a, a machinery of destruction. And, and that's very interesting. It's also highly problematic. I have recently looked very carefully at that. It's highly problematic because Hilberg has different machines. He identifies different machines, the German machine, Eastern European machines, of destruction, even a Jewish machine of destruction. And one of the things that you can show when you look very carefully at each time he mentions machine of destruction, one of the things you can show is that he fact actually identified with the German machine uh, because he developed standards of efficiency that was based on the German administration. And he judged negatively the other machines, the Eastern European, the Hungarian, the Jewish one. None of them were up to par. The, the very truly efficient one was the German. So there, there is very problematic figuration, one could argue, especially from our point of view, in the margins um, of the destruction of European Jews. But I would argue, in, first and foremost, the book is about laying a groundwork, laying empirical groundwork, and disciplining what I would call time and space. But, but also space is extremely important. He moves from one location to the other. And also this metaphor of the machinery of destruction is not a dynamic one. Uh, the machine doesn't change. The machine is always the same. 
So, so in, you, one could suggest that the book, thousands of pages, is a snapshot. It's a snapshot of looking at the machine working at different places simultaneously after, after that's not so important. It's the a state of affairs that he's tried to capture. There's some famous sentences uh, in, in uh, the destruction of European Jews. Uh, one of them is that uh, the factors uh, were all in place. So Hitler only had to come to power. He only had to come to power and so to speak, push the button and the machine would begin. Uh, and would then run its course. So in, in that sense, you know, um, the, the, all the factors were there. You don't, you don't have to narrativize them. There is no turning point in the whole book. It's just the implementation of a program that was, in that sense, predetermined. So that's how I would look at the book. And, and I would also say it's reception history. So the discussions about uh, the Jewish leadership, um, the appreciation of the metaphors, uh, all of this is secondary. The book to this date is used as a chronology. If you want to find out what happened um, on the ground in Czechoslovakia in 1942, you look at Raoul Hilberg. What happened in the last phase of the final solution? Who went where, you know, when did the camps close? Where did people, when did people, uh, when did the victims arrive in Bergen-Belsen, for example? You look at Ralph Hilberg. It's, it's to look at it from maybe, maybe from White's perspective. Often, um, the book is used as a chronology, as a very reliable tool to try to understand um, the, 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 the different facts, the different facts of the matter. And the question of, of uh, Hilberg's biting irony and the question um, of the metaphors of the machinery of destruction, they are uh, secondary, I would argue, to its use and to its history and to its, its intentions. So this is one, point one, more description than narration and argument. Another one. Another interesting case, a very important case uh, following on Raoul Hilberg, because if there was ever a student of Raoul Hilberg's, uh, Raoul Hilberg taught as a, at an institution without a PhD. If there ever was a student, it's Christopher Browning. And Christopher Browning um, produced in, published in 2004, uh, one of the most important synthetic histories of the Holocaust, the origins of the final solution, part of another series. So it's clearly determined. He only deals with uh, developments from 1939 to 1942. Uh, it's important also to see his publications in the context of other publications that I would argue have more narrative uh, ambition and narrative volition. Um, but I would say that doesn't necessarily apply to the origins of the final solution. The origins of the final solution, if, if anything, is even less uh, concerned with narration, with entertaining narration, with uh, grasping uh, narration. It's even more concerned with trying to get the record straight. And I would argue one thing that Chris Browning does is he tries to he tries to deliver for that specific topic the kind of empirical saturated uh, description that we also find in Raoul Hilberg without the figurative ideological political excess that is part of Raoul Hilberg so the text is even more subdued more subdued in terms of its vocabulary more subdued in terms of its ambition to develop colligatory concepts. It is even more kind of low key to the ground, empirically um, successful. So, but there is one interesting exception to this and the exception perhaps also proves the rule uh, and, sh and shows the importance of empiricism in the book the importance of description by, by, by way of its tolerance for difference. Because in the middle 
of the origins of the final solution, there's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, Chris Browning, generous scholar that he is, invited a colleague to write a chapter about one of the key uh, phases in the development of the final solution, Chris Jürgen Matthäus uh, from the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And if you look at that chapter compared to the other chapters written by Chris, Christopher Browning, you can see that there are differences, different figures. There's not an agreement between the two on, on some of the key questions, including the figure of Hitler. We will look at that. There are actually two different Hitlers here. Right? You, have, you have, on the one hand, the Hitler that uh, prefers the role of the observer to that of the decision maker. On the other hand, you have you know, the, the Hitler who inaugurated the decision making process. That's, that's tension between the two sentences who is less interested in the Jewish question than other broader problems, and a statement that is Hitler that is directly involved and controlled the, the pace of events. And then a Hitler that is totally dysfunctional, that is spewing nonsense, for example, arguing that we shouldn't give weapons to non-Germans. And then on the other hand, that major decisions can only be taken with him. Uh, so there are two different figures here. One very close to the action, making all the decisions. One Hitler figure that is quite uh, aloof, not that interested. And if he is involved in details, it doesn't make any sense. I would argue uh, this generosity uh, in the middle of the origins of the final solution, you can actually say this instability in the middle of the final solution. Some of the key chapters seem to be disagreeing and the disagreement is never really clearly addressed, um, is certainly never removed, speaks to the empirical tolerance and empirical generosity uh, of the book. And the book here clearly is not identical to the main author uh, because there are two authors and uh, still uh, one text. So I would suggest um, we, we have a book here of descriptive integrity, so much descriptive integrity that the book also clearly says, well, well there are different perspectives here. We can look at these, the, the facts are in that sense, not, not completely clear. And I would call it, uh, by referring to, uh, to Chantal Mouffe, uh, I would call it inadvertent agonism. That is a multi-perspectivity that was never planned uh, in the book. Um, Chris Browning is not very uh, ambitious uh, in establishing new colligatory concepts, with one exception. He mostly uses other people's, also very much so uh, Raoul Hilberg's. Um, and, he and there is this ambition of laying out, integrating all the research and laying out the events between 39 and 41 factually saturated and moving again from, from place to place to show uh, how it has unfolded. There is one uh, uh, concept that Browning suggests and where he takes responsibility for and that he advances. And that is um, that the final solution resulted from the euphoria of victory. It's a concept I already alluded to. And that's Browning's theory supported by other scholars, but not all, uh, that the decision was taken by Hitler and his henchmen um, in the early fall of 1941 to now launch the final solution, the mass murder of all Jews within the realm of the Third Reich, in a moment of triumph, in the moment when they thought uh, they would win uh, the war against the Soviet Union. Uh, and so that's what, what Browning calls the euphoria of victory. A number of scholars disagree with him and, and they would argue quite the opposite. They would argue um, that the decision was taken later and that the decision was taken in the moment when the Nazi leader should realize that the war was actually lost. So later, 1941, 1941, 1942. Um, but that, neither here nor there, this, this colligatory concept doesn't play a decisive role uh, in the book. He, is not, he doesn't have great ambition here. What, what the ambition of the book is to get the facts straight, even if they point in different directions. 
So even at the price of narrative or argumentative cohesion. Okay, uh, next, second to the final uh, example here. Georg, you have to tell me what, how we are doing with time. Um, well, I, have, I didn't check. I think you're speaking for about 50 minutes now, 50, sort of something like that. Oh, so then we should come to an end rapidly. Well, it's up to you, but closer to the end than to the start if possible. Is the book is 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 on the cusp. You know, where, where I, I would suggest that Hilberg and Browning are descriptive books, using narration and argumentation to advance the task of description. Here, uh, there's something very intriguing going on because Friedlander, at least the texter in the book, has very, very complex ambitions. Uh, the ambition is, is twofold. On the one hand, uh, the texter wants to advance a, a clear trajectory of interpretation. And here, he is probably more of an arguer uh, than, for instance, Browning, because he wants to argue uh, that it was ideology that made the final solution happen, and it was ideology driven by the top. That is, this is, um, this is a kind of complex intentionalist view of the origins uh, of the final solution. And that's one of the agendas. One of the agenda of the book is very clearly to see Hitler, henchmen, decisions, power, and, and we can clearly see how also narrative uh, textual modes of advancements are used to deliver that argument. So he's also arguing a little bit more than Brown. But then again, there is a different, very, very different descriptive agenda here that the texter has. And that agenda is also driving the structure of the book. And let me try to explain. The book, the texter, wants to uh, impart on the reader how the victims felt. That is at least as important. I would say it's more important in the agenda than an explanation of the causes of the final solution. So the form of the book creates all kinds of uh, insecurities, destabilizations. There's first of all, the geographical disorientation. The book changes places all the time. It can change, it can change location, historical location between paragraphs. It can change historical location five times, six times on the same page. So this is already somewhat disorienting. The same happens with time. Since the book is everywhere, the book also goes forward and back again and again and again and again. So you have the same, uh, same moments of time in different places, one after the other often. So you don't really know where you are. A perfect example to show this is that Heydrich is often in the book. He's alive, he's dead. He's alive, he's dead. He's alive, he's dead. He's alive, he's dead. This is what, chi what I call chronosophical oscillation, right? Uh, so it's inducing a type of, a little bit of a confusion. Of course, we know where we are. We know what it's about. But do we always clearly know where we are in this process? I would argue no. And then uh, the book also has what I would call causal multidirectionality. So the, of course, ideology is very important. But then the text just says, almost in passing often, this is not ideology. The average German soldier, ideology was not important for them. Yeah. So, so there again and again, he's kind of shooting down his own arguments. And in the end, I would argue, we come here as close as is possible for a successful uh, professional historian. We come to something I would, I would suggest is reminiscent of unreliable narration. It's self-destabilizing, very self-reflexive, um, creating a kind of disorientation. Why? Because the whole book wants to convey a feeling of insecurity, panic even. It, the book gives little homeopathic dosages of disorientation, reminiscent of the feelings and the experiences of the victims. 
who also had no clue what is happening next. Where are the Germans? What are the intentions? Can I survive if I work? Uh, should I flee now? Should I not? So this sense of disorientation is reflected in the book's structure. So therefore, I'm arguing the book wants to capture, describe, convey, immerse the reader into that state of mind. And therefore, in the end, the book is also about description more than anything else but in a much more complicated way uh, than the other books. So that's my hypothesis about Friedland. Last case study, and here we cannot go into details, we we'll do it at a later point in time. Uh, I, have a, I have a clear uh, hypothesis about bloodlands, an extremely interesting, uh, interesting case, and we can discuss it perhaps later. Let me summarize here. I would argue uh, bloodlands is a deeply disingenuous book because bloodlands is a book that is deeply involved in arguments, in the politics of memory. You know, and you can see that, that here, you know, in this sentence where the, where the texter says, um, you know, whenever you, you let go of historical accuracy, you end up in a very difficult uh, political situation. That's, uh, that's the argument here. So what he argues is we have made big mistakes in the politics of memory after 1945, uh, because we have never paid enough attention uh, to Eastern Europe. But if we pay attention to the facts, then we can also correct our memory and finally get European memory right. That's the, that's the argument in a nutshell. Highly problematic because you know, there is no direct link between history and memory. <laughs> memory has a very, very different types of dynamics than history, let alone professional historiography. So in that sense, this causal relationship doesn't exist. It's purely imaginary. But that's the argument of the book. But the book doesn't come out and say, this is my argument. Eh, in sentences like, yeah but it always says that's the, it's the fact. So the book pretends to be merely descriptive, but it is deeply politically, and in that sense, deeply ideological. There is a disingenuity uh, in the book that I find absolutely intriguing. We can, we can look at this, uh, you know, how the book treats numbers, you know, how to create an equivalence between Nazi crimes and Soviet crimes. It's absolutely fantastic if you look at you know, the bloodlands as they're defined, then it's very clearly the Nazi crimes were you know, worse. Um, but uh, the book constantly shifts criteria of judgment and then ends up somewhere else where they, where they seem to be much closer. Um, and the book uh, constantly argues that Auschwitz should not be important. Auschwitz has received a far too much attention. That is what I would call this passive aggressive deconstruction of Holocaust history. Now, I, I'm not saying that the argument cannot be made uh, that our Holocaust memory is problematic. I, I, absolutely, we can ask serious questions about that and I would be one of the first to ask these questions. But I'm again referring to this passive aggressiveness of the book to advance political, uh, uh, political arguments by way of allegedly historical facts. There is something that is deeply, deeply disturbing about the book, and I would say deeply dishonest. And there are lots of examples here. I want to highlight maybe the last sentence here that, that is so bizarre that, you know, you, you wonder why it's there. Why has the text decided to have that sentence? Look at the last, last line here. More non-Jewish Poles died at Auschwitz than the Jews of any European country, with only two exceptions, Hungary and Poland itself, right? So, so but you have there that sentence, more non-Jewish Poles died at Auschwitz than the Jews of any European country. If you end it there, you have all of Poland uh, jumping up um, uh, with you know, enthusiasm. It's a bizarre sentence, uh, and it seems to be the program of the book. Now we can go into what I would call immersive violence. And here we can then ask the question, uh, which we, we can do maybe together. What about uh, bloodlands as a qualificatory concept? Uh, what's the value in terms of exemplification, coherence, comprehensiveness, scope, and originality? But what I would like to do is to go back and place my uh, 
my uh, 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 texters here, uh, texters represented by you know their uh, authors, I want to uh, place them in the in the pyramid. So I would argue that the most descriptive here is uh, Chris Browning, uh, the one that is least also concerned with contradiction, for example, in the text itself. Um, a person who is also has primarily descriptive ambition, capturing the feelings of the victims, that's, they haven't changed. You know, in, in Friedlander's book, the, the feelings of the victims never change. He ends the book saying, I feel the same uh, today as I felt then. It feels the same. You can't get away from it, right? So, so this is, there's no change over time. Uh, this is a very nice uh, 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 example to emphasize how, how much this is static. Um, but I would say uh, Friedlander with his ex very developed interest in narration, you know, Proust is one of his heroes. Um, he, he has a narrative key. There is a narrative key to the text that is, that is quite important, even if it's more descriptive than narrative. And, the, uh, and he also argues a little more, I would say, than Browning. And Hilberg is up there because he has these tangential arguments, despite the fact that the book is descriptive. Now, finally, Snyder. This is a deeply argumentative book, deeply argumentative, uh, while pretending to be descriptive. And, and that's the sleight of hand that unfortunately you see quite often in writings of professional history. Question remaining, where are the books that are, have primarily uh, invested in narrative advancement? In the ones that I have chosen so far, I do not find them. I think I would find them in popular uh, media. I would find them in film, for example, about the Holocaust. I would find them in some more popular publications. I would find them uh, in memoirs, Holocaust memoirs. But I would argue at this point, at this state of Holocaust historiography, that indeed is not very likely. And I would also argue that fields go through a type of trajectory itself. They often start uh, with description and advance towards argumentation. But it seems to be, and here I, I'm in agreement with the post-narrativists, it seems to be that the object-sidedness of a lot of professional uh, historical writing in the field of Holocaust history um, is, is, indeed, is indeed true, that a lot of the writing is, is object-sided and uh, not as subject-sided as one would assume, for example, from uh, uh, Hayden White's uh, point of view. I'll stop here and then we can discuss. And I pull out. <clears throat> Thank you very much yes. for your for your talk. Um, apologies for the length. Oh, <laughs> no, no apologies needed, I guess. Um, okay, now we are in the discussion session, obviously. So, um, is there any questions immediately or comments? Okay, I think I see Irene Franziska Fritschke. Fritsche, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, I I'm still have problems with Zoom. I find it very awkward to be on Zoom. However, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, this very, 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 very interesting uh, presentation. And I have basically uh, two questions that are related, I think. Um, and my, the nature of my question would be discursive analytical. And I would... Uh, it, it's about Timothy Snyder and Monika Flutanik. And basically mm -hmm. it's the same problem. So um, uh, what, I would, uh, what I would say is that, I mean, I read, uh, I'm coming from literary criticism in the beginning. And you mentioned in the beginning that the narrat narratologists try to sort of, um, the motivation would be really some sort of mostly objective as I, get it out of words or they try not to slide into arguments, not to slide into any kind of, um, yeah. However, so so the thing is, however, with Monica Flutanik, I read her book, uh, Narrative Factuality, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and when I read the chapter on Hen White, written by Frank Zipfel, mm-hmm. basically it does not hang on to that. It does not ha- hang on to the idea of uh, narratologists can come in and can find some sort of object, mm-hmm. mostly objective uh, categories. And um, that is because Monika Flodenik itself comes more or less from the friendly she, she sees analytical uh, um, literary criticism very friendly, which is why we find people like Tillman Köppe in her book, for example. The, the question though, however, and that brings me to uh, Timothy Snyder, and I very much like, uh, I really agree to how, what you say about Timothy Snyder's book. Um, I discussed this very, very often, the blood lens with actually with uh, Russian historians that are very opposed to its idea. Uh, because it's they find many people find it very unproductive how he writes. Um, because if you make bloodlands out of these countries, then what is there to do? What is there discursive to do? What can how can you get out of that some sort of cul de sac? Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, the thing is, however, how do, what do you 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 try to engage some sort of uh, middle position between post narrativism and narrativist uh, positions? You would not completely agree to Hayden White, but you would read Hayden White friendly, but still would tend, as I understand it, to go to the Kukan in direction. And um, my question would simply be, if you read, for example, if you read reviews, for example, of Bloodlands, Mm -hmm. there, Timothy Snyder is very often criticized to be manipulative. Mm -hmm. So his description is from from a narratologistic point of view, very manipulative and actually wrong. So many, many scholars go, as far as saying it's just simply actually not true what he says um, or in the way he puts it in his rhetorics. So what do you make out of your, um, the way you, you, what you, what you argue for? What do you make out of the actual reactions to those pieces, uh, to, the, to the critic of it? I mean, how, because as I understand it, it will constantly undermine any kind of interpretation that would be some sort of more set as, uh, unite the different positions between theor- post-narrativist the- theorists and narrativist theorists and so on. So how, what, what do you make out of that constant clash, out, out of that constant undermining? How can we get out of the past 50 years, so to speak? Yeah. And that's a that's a that's a very good question. <laughs> Should I answer, Georg? Or... I, um, I think we take it one by one. Please answer. Okay, sounds and, good. And that, yes, yes. Uh, yes, that's a that's a very good question, and uh, and I think what I find so uh, refreshing from a from the refreshing contribution I I think from a post narrativist point of view is precisely to 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 begin to develop some criteria. Uh, that we can we can then use to, uh, for example, assess how successful a book has delivered or failed to deliver uh, an argument, right? But but I, the the first task is then to I mean one of the I, I think one of the, the strategies is to get out of the deadlock. One of them is to um, separate texts from author. I think it hasn't helped us that we are we are constantly conflating the two. I think texts uh, exist very separately from from their authors, and that's why it's so important to refer to a text uh, imminent uh, element, like what I call the texter, what traditionally is called the narrator. I call it the texter because you know I'm not just interested in narration; I'm also interested in other primary modes of advancement. And there, I think one can. The, the, the Snyder phenomenon, the bloodland phenomenon can actually be put in relatively clear terms why this book is problematic. Uh, I think it's problematic because we could now play with the uh, Yoni Mati's uh, you know, five categories and also show it from that side. But I think it's problematic um, because of its, the way it, of its composition. I disagree that it gets its facts wrong. I think most of the facts are not wrong. Uh, 
uh, they reflect uh, the state of the art at that point in time. I haven't uh, seen any really compelling uh, point where he got, where he got key uh, facts wrong. But it's the composition of it that is so passive aggressively problematic, right? Where, I mean, for instance, the number, right? Where, where he cannot bring himself to say 6 million, even, even if he wants to criticize it. The whole book doesn't include the important um, symbolic number 6 million even once. Uh, he says 5.4, 5.7. And he vacillates between these numbers with good reason, because sometimes he includes the Hungarian Jews and sometimes he doesn't. But what he does in terms of textual performance, he destroys the icon 6 million. And that's not an innocent, right? So I want him to step forward and do this. I want the text to step forward and say, say these things. Say, I'm not using the 6 million because I think we are paying way too much attention to the Holocaust. We have, pay, we have to start paying a lot more attention to the uh, victims of Stalinism and the victims of, of Nazis in Eastern Europe. And from the position where we are in today, he might have a very good point, but come forward and say this transparently, right? That will be my first, my first um, expectation uh, to, to Timothy Snyder. Um, and then we can, you know, then we can argue. Uh, I don't, I'm not opposed to, to somebody taking that position. Why shouldn't he? He's entitled to taking that position. And there's so many other ways where I'm indeed manipulative is the word, but I would, I would probably understand manipulative differently from, let's say, historians. Uh, I find it, for example, the way that he uses scenes of violence, right, where he's trying to establish in a bizarre way, always an equivalent, for example, between sexual violence committed by Soviets and sexual violence committed uh, by Nazis. A, a strange equivalent that he's uh, providing and so on. So, so this idea of, of that, that, that equivalence, I find how it's done, I find it, I find it problematic. It's the sleight of hand. It's, it's the sleight of hand to vigorously argue and then to say, hey, I'm just giving you the facts. Yeah, that, that's what I find in the book. And if you want to call that manipulative, yes, but it would be specifically for my uh, theoretical point of view, uh, manipulative. And indeed, to come back to your final point, I, mean, I have to admit that the, the sound wasn't great when you talked about Fludanik. And as far as I'm aware, Monica has also changed her position. You know, she's much less uh, clearly now demarcating the lines. But in some of her earlier writings, she was quite explicit in saying, Historical writing is not my task. It's, it's, it's outside the purview of narratology because it's not concerned with narrative. And I, I'm not saying she's right or wrong. I, I think she's not, you know, as I try to suggest, there are different types of history. So in that sense, I would say she's wrong. But I find the argument is refreshing. The argument is refreshing to also say, wait a second, you know, to the narratologist, it's not all, it's not always about, about narrative. But you're right. I mean, if, if I have an agenda, if I, if I can accomplish something, then I'm, I would like to, with this material, I would like to indeed argue um, as to the multi-perspectivity of the game, you know, as, as to argue that it's not a zero sum. It's historians are in the fantastic situation. They can play three different language games, three different modes of advancement. And and that's something they should cherish. And that's also something that in the, in the theory of history, I think that flexibility, um, we have perhaps not paid enough attention to because one of the implications is that description as a mode of advancement, what historians would say as capturing past reality, the coherence, uh, uh, the correspondence uh, hypothesis is indeed more important than the narrativist the linguistic term has given historians credit for. And in that sense, I, I would also um, disagree with Hayden uh, to a point, you know, to a point. May I just answer sh just one, 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 two sentences? We, we have a bit more, well, if it's two sentences, really, if it's only two sure. sentences, but we have somebody else who would like to pose a question. Oh. Yeah. Yes, okay, please. two sentences, just, uh, just in Monica Flodan, in Monica Flodan's book, there is uh, she she uh, the the person who is uh, dealing with Hayden White makes out of him a pan uh, fictionalist, uh, 
which is a political ideology ideological point of view and slides into arguments yeah. so so th just this just yeah. That, so. yeah yeah Thank you much. Uh, Yoni Mati, you're the next. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Well, I, I begin with, I'm, I, I must say that I'm, I'm very impressed of this talk of yours. And um, even given that you gave me such a prominent role, which is too, too much, probably. Uh, but I think this is the best, um, most creative and most cutting edge outlining of what's going on in, in theory of history, at least regarding discipline of uh, historiography, uh, the best I've seen. And, and then I was also impressed of the, uh, the way you went into the texts uh, of these books, kind of rolling up the sleeves and trying to see what, what, uh, what is really the structures of the, of the book. I, think I haven't seen that much done and it, it should be done more and see actually what we can make out of the books when we really start analyzing the different te textual and argumented structures and so on. Um, um, I'm, I'm interested in um, something that isn't stated in the 2015 book of mine. Um, I, I guess my question is, do you think um, there is, why there is such a field like historiography? That's, that's a simple question. Sort of the, what's the discipline rationale of uh, historiography? Why, why there should be historians? And, um, uh, do you think there is one or do you think there are many? And um, um, I have been starting using, actually thinking about this notion disciplinary rationale. And um, let's say, and my answer would be that it's argumentation, trying to say something about the past. And while achieving this, this, this can be achieved by many ways. And it could be, we could use narration, we could use description, we could use um, perhaps argumentation, we could use anecdotes, we could use statistics and, and whatever. And that's, that's the matter when we go down to the textual level. And well, we, we might even ask, do we need a text or can we do it visually, audio visually and some, some modern means that have been uh, under work. Um, but if there's this one discipline rationale, then there might be several ways to achieve it. And I, I guess my question is, you, 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 you propose this multidirectional theory of history. Um, can you put these ideas in your theory somehow? Um, because also I, I think I could accept that there are many ways of um, history and working towards a goal or towards argumentative goal. But for me, the point would really not to, I mean, what, what, what other kind of discipline rationales they might be? I mean, it might be entertainment or it might be telling a story or, or uh, telling the truth, I and mean, at least in somebody's mind and so on and so forth. But for me, it's, it's to make a cognitive good case, rational case, compelling case for seeing mm -hmm. something as something. Yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, that's a key question. Very, very important question. Um, and I, I think that's precisely where I feel that also your contribution is so important because to, to raise that question, there is um, that, that there, there are key elements, maybe the most decisive elements of historical writing or the work of historian, let's call it that for the moment, um, that are not about factuality, that are not about the empirical foundations, uh, but that nevertheless should, can be and should be subject to rational criteria of assessment. That what I've that that I think is a that's precisely what has elevated the position of the post the post narrativist position has elevated it to a coherent position. I think that's the qualitative shift uh, that, in my view, uh, and and you know uh, happened for example with your book. You know, and that is a qualitative shift in I think in the history of historical theory that we will come to acknowledge more in the coming years. Uh, the field is a little slow as the field is also getting smaller and smaller, I'm afraid uh, to say. But, but to come back to your key question, 
yes, there, there is. A, there is in my not that I'm able to put it in as clear a terminology as you have been able to, but my um, my gut feeling is indeed that there are different goals, uh, even inside uh, professional historical writing, that the different goals are subject. Uh, they, they they coexist. Uh, they may even coexist in the same publication, but they coexist certainly uh, in, in the similar points in time with regard to different textures and regard different authors. Um, but I think it's also uh, important that a change as a field is developing. So that applies. So there is a there is a history to the preferred modes of textual advancement or the preferred purposes of professional historical products. And, and I would say as a field is developing, it is often very concerned with correspondence. It's very concerned with facts. It's very con con concerned with chronology. And, and in that concern, of course, there's narrative always present. You cannot be concerned with the past without having change over time be part of the text. But I find in many texts, also in my own field, I find other primary concerns. So the primary concern, for example, I would say in Raoul Hilberg in that book, the primary concern of the texter, you know, maybe the, maybe the primary concern of Raoul Hilberg as a person was to hit hard on the failure of the Jewish leadership, that can be. But I see the text, the texter having a different primary concern. And that primary concern is, look what happened. You know, look what happened. Look what happened in Auschwitz. Look what happened in Berlin. Look what happened in Greece. Look what happened on the ground in these places. So despite the fact that every single sentence is always is concerned with change over time, what I see as the overriding concern, and that, that's what our difference is, what I see as the overriding concern is, yes, it's an argument, but the argument look is, look, this happened, right? And then the argument is, to move more through space than through time. You know, look at the extraordinary incom encompassing a whole um, continent. Look at that, right? So, so that the texture is providing this, I would, I would more compare it to a travel writing than, you know, traumatic travel writing in a sense, right? Look at all these moments and places of extreme criminal activity. That seems to be what I would see the, the primary concern. So somewhere between a chronology in the sense of a medieval chronology and an exploration of, of spaces of crimes. You know, in that sense, quite, you know, in terms of textual complexity, the sentences, also the sentences that are tying different chapters together the sentences where the texter steps forward and tries to give the text a trajectory. So many of these sentences are not about time. They are, they are about how the machine, how the machine works. They are descriptive, you know, and the machine is a, maybe a terrible metaphor. The machine also seems to imply the machine is automatic. They don't seem to be perpetrators. It's a highly problematic metaphor, but it's an honest metaphor in the sense that Raoul Hilberg, as a person, as a survivor himself, he wanted to grasp this thing and describe it for us. He, he was not interested in, in narration in that sense, right? Complex narration. So and I, I would also here uh, emphasize, I think also a thing, what I see and what I see myself also in agreement with a post-narrativist point of view, that there is a difference between low level narration and high complexity narration. There's a difference between describing the events of a mass murder, for example, and developing a, a, a highly dynamic, narratively dynamic colligatory concept, right? Those are, diff those are different levels. And also with regard to narration, when it comes to the low level of complexity, we can often reach agreement about the facts you know, about, about low level narration. It's the, it's the high level, the more abstract level where, which are disconnected from the low level narration. The low level narration have factual integrity. Abstract level narration does not. And I see in, in Raoul Hilbert, for example, a limited, um, limited ambition to tie all the different 
places together by way of a narrative, uh, ambitious and complex concept. Uh, machinery of destruction is not a complex narrative colligatory concept. It's, it's a machine, right? It's, it's not complex. It just, it's automatic. You know, it has changed over time, but it does so in ways that are not, for example, they are not intriguing. They are not narratively intriguing in the way that fiction is. You know, uh, that's why I understand Monika Fludanik's reflex from 10, 15 years ago, what she said, that's not for me. That's not complex enough. You know, that's not maybe intriguing enough, maybe entertaining enough, maybe, but whatever it is, I understand her reflex, despite the fact that I can point at every page and, and see time is, is also of the essence. But the first, the first uh, ambition is description correspondence. The first ambition is, you know, nobody had, nobody ever had the same control over the sources that Raoul Hilberg had. Nobody ever again will probably have it. And that, that descriptive ambition, that almost tactile ambition, that's a different one. So, so I, would, I would want to differentiate these three modes, right? I would want to differentiate also the mode of narration we have narrative histories. They are the histories which are very entertaining, that are very immersive, where you glide in. And I think you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, very immersive narration shares that with other media. But what happens is when we talk about other media, and it's a very good question, could, could professional historians deliver the same you know, a job and the same uh, service by way of other media? Yes, they could but it would fundamentally change what they do because the moment you visualize and the moment you have an auditory uh, level and you, the moment you, you put them together, you have a completely different medium, right? And you don't have the challenge of linearity anymore and you do not have the challenge that historians now had in the past. They had to kind of settle on one primary mode of linear advancement. I would say either description or uh, narration or argumentation. And then of course books shifts, right? They shift between the introduction that are often much more argumentative and the body of the text and all these things, that's clear. But linearity, when linearity is out and we're dealing with different modes coexisting, uh, what I'm arguing, I would say doesn't work anymore. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the dilemma, what I would call the dilemma of the story. And I had a slide prepared at the end, this dilemma between, between empiricism, digging into the archive and coming up with a version that doesn't seem to easily be able to settle on one narrative trajectory or on one argumentative trajectory. It's, it's too dispersive, right? And that's why Browning is so honest. He just let it be in the same book, right? He just let it be that this doesn't add up and we have two Hitlers in the same book, right? Um, so, so that's what I, that's what, I, that's what I would, so I would suggest, of course you are right. And I would, even, I would even agree with you that the majority of contemporary historiography, professional historical writing is about argumentation. I would agree with you there. I think you hit it, the, you hit it the nail right on the head. But I would say it wasn't always the case. And I would say whenever new fields take shape, there are phases that are more descriptive than argumentative. And whenever tastes change, it's more about narration. I think Hayden, you know, didn't see uh, how important argumentation is, or he misconstrued argumentation as in his, in his structure, because he was looking at the 19th century when narration was key, right? It's not by coincidence that he's looking at, at uh, historians who were much more wedded to narration because they are coexisting with narrative realism. Uh, you know, the, 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 the narration par excellence. So, so in that sense, I think also history has changed. I would suggest as a hypothesis, our mode of textual advancement now is argumentation. 19th century, early 20th century, it was narration. And here's another point, because it was about felt identity. I think we are now maybe more in the realm of when it comes to professional historical writing. After all, we should not forget historians have lost their role as the arbiter of collective memory. 
They were the arbiter of collective memory in the 19th century and the early 20th century. So therefore they were, their narratives, they channeled identity emotionally, right? Effectively. And we don't do that any longer. Our, that's not lo longer our job. What we do now is we channel, we channel rational identity. We channel, we, 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 we now address our work to our colleagues and other intellectuals. And they, they, we try to compel them by way of arguments, not by way of an emotional narrative. But that was used to be different. And I think the moment, and those historians after all still exist, the moment historians step out of the ivory tower and they try to write books for the masses, right? For the educated elites, then they still in the business of providing narrative, uh, emotional identity, immersion. Look at Richard Evans when he writes about the Third Reich, right? Um, I would, you know, I could, I could argue now, that would be a provocative one, and an argument I should have with uh, Peter in another occasion. I think some of Peter's book, books are more concerned with narration than argumentation. You know, here, here we have an interesting example. But, but see, you see the point, right? The point being that I, I completely agree with you about the importance of argumentation and it's also its, its prevalence right now. But I think we should, for two reasons, I want to have the other modes also present because I also want to speak to and look at the, at the enigma of history from the perspective of what is called often working historians and their sense of their own work is more of correspondence, of description. That's how they see themselves. And I want to take that very seriously, not just uh, as, so to speak, a gesture of empathy, but as an analytical perspective. I want to give it more weight in the discussion. And I want to, and I also feel that description is what you would call object sidedness in a different mode, right? And therefore it's so important. I, I, I want three. I want the three. I want the triangle. I want the whole triangle. <laughs> I don't want to give it up yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Wolf. Um, we had two more questions and initially I also had one more, but um, maybe for the sake of time, um, would you like to hear them together, Wolf? Or would you want to respond to them individually? I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 whatever you decide, I'm, I'm very flexible. I, uh, I want to highlight uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, Oh, yes. uh, recommendations, what we need, yes. Uh, if, oh, yeah, that's, that's for later, sorry. Um, well, it, but but uh, you, okay. you tell me what I'm doing. Uh, well, I mean, we, we, we are a bit on the long side already, but it doesn't matter. We sorry, can, yes. We, 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 we can, we can uh, go on still a bit. Just, well, just one point before, can I? Yeah, uh, well, there are two more questions, but... No, no, it, it's a formal point. If uh, Wolf has some recommendation for literature, maybe, yes. maybe that can be taken off here as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So um, that's a good point. Maybe either now or in the end, at the very end, that you shortly still have some recommendations for literature that you would like to give us or the person sure. who asked. I, I'll, the per I, the I person, do that. Yes. The person who asked. But yeah. um, okay, let's take these two questions individually still and then eventually give another round possible for you to have the last word. But um, Sultan was the yeah. first to raise his hand. Then Carla. Yes, thank you. And first of all, thanks all for the for the presentation and also for the center for providing this occasion for exchange uh, continuously now since quite a long time. Uh, my question was actually partly answered uh, in your by your previous answer because what I wanted to ask uh, was relating to the success of narrativism within within the. Um, within the field of theory and philosophy of history, because I was a bit struck by uh, your triangle that you were unable, of course, you were studying a certain historiographical literature, and I was struck by that you were unable to assign to the narrativist part, uh, you know, actual historiographical works. Mm -hmm. And then that made me wonder that, uh, you know, in retrospect, then how would you explain the success of, of the narrativist position and its well, I would say almost unquestionable dominance in the field in the past decades. And that's, uh, you know, for me, it's a very interesting question also because I think that a lot of interesting things are happening in the theory and philosophy of history outside the theory and philosophy of historiography in the first place. But if you are focused on, as also Yomni Matti uh, may feel, for the theory and, and, and philosophy of historiography, then yes, it's true narrativism was in a dominant position, 
and uh, and uh, what we imply that Hayden White was looking for 19th century when when studying uh, actual historical works. That's true, but Hayden White alone doesn't make up uh, the dominance uh, of the field. So the question sort of still stands, I think. Uh, yes, and, and, and you, um, it's very interesting. You, you're pushing me, uh, very much appreciate that. It's a very good question, pushing me almost past my point of comfort. <laughs> because, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm certainly um, studied with Hayden and White and, and uh, in, in many ways uh, feel very much indebted uh, uh, to his work. And you're right. And, and maybe there are different answers. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I, I don't do this continuously. I'm often, you know, occupied by memory studies and the activities in memory studies that at the moment my primary field. So, so I jump into when opportunities like this arise and I do try uh, to read and write. Um, but I'm wondering if my explanations are therefore good enough. Um, yeah. The linguistic turn as a as a mistake, <laughs> uh, as as one that systematically uh, misconstrues what happens in the in the when historians go to the archives, uh, when historians write. Um, that's a very provocative idea for me. I'm, I I don't know if I want to go that far yet. Uh, my first point is, and and this is. Um, if I look at Holocaust uh, historiography or Holocaust historical writing, which I know best, I indeed, by following the lead of other theorists like Yoni Mati, I indeed find uh, not that many as yet um, narratively driven professional books. You know, the books, the, the research books, the research texts, the texts that are trying to where people trying to, pos to um, position themselves as researchers, where people try to advance their careers, where people write their, their books. I don't, I feel they are now about argumentation and were, you know, in an evolving field like Holocaust studies, were more about description. Um, and therefore, and you also have to keep in mind that Holocaust historiography is a young field. I mean, it really came into existence as a popular field only in the 1990s, really. So we don't have that many years. Um, so what else could be, could be the, the explanations? I think one of the explanations is political. Uh, I think, you know, theorists, philosophers like Hayden um, were very frustrated with the inherent conservatism of the historical discipline. Uh, I think he felt that uh, historians uh, were too often, uh, also in the discussions of the day, too often on the side of the status quo. They were not progressive enough. Um, and I think that is that criticism is part of the ethos of meta history. Um, and I, I think it's a different, different understanding of what academic work is. And I, for one, feel very much attracted to that, the ethics of an academic world. I mean, let me give you, a, give you a, 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 maybe an anecdote. In the field of memory studies, you know, memory studies, which I would argue is more attuned to politics, is more attuned to the question of the ethics of the representation of the past. I think even in that field, I'm somewhat of, a, of an outlier because I feel that if we do memory, memory studies in all of our theories that we like so much, let's remember the politics of it. Let's remember the politics of memory because that's why the field exists. And so, so this political impetus is one that I find very attractive, but it's very possible that the political impetus of the linguistic turn and maybe even its theoretical structuralist impetus has um, 
caused a significant misperception of what history and historians do. That's very possible. It's very possible that that's how we look back at this moment. I'm still looking and maybe if I don't find a lot examples in the field of, of Holocaust studies, maybe, maybe that's also perhaps because unlike so many other fields, see in other fields, playing with different implotments as Hayden would have called it is normal. In the field of Holocaust history, it's tricky to, to play with different implotments. To write a romance about the Holocaust when you're writing professional history is tricky, unless you're writing a memoir of survival, right? Yes, then you can do this. But unless you're writing maybe a history of, of survivors, maybe you're writing a history of, of helpers, you know, it's tricky to write about the final solution, the decision-making process, the violence, the, the, the mass murder. It's difficult to do this in a different key, in a different type of implotment than, 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 than tragedy. And, and here, look, we shouldn't forget that in the end, that insight even forced Hayden to change, uh, apparently change his mind, right? That's why he then, in that famous piece, in probing the limits of representation, he said there are indeed limits to what, how the final solution can be implotted. And, and I, for one, at that point, didn't see the reason. Why? Why would you pull back? And I think we have to contextualize it. It was the moment after the historian's debate, and, and uh, Hayden also did not want to be, appear as an, apolo an apologist for the conservatives uh, who had uh, you know, argued for we can we can have different types of implotments. You know, in in essence, they they were using his arguments. So, so I think the explanation here is is political. I'm not ready yet to pull narrative history from the repertoire of professional historical writing. I don't know enough about it. I think if we go to other fields, uh, fields that are less dark fields that are less depressing, um, then I assume there's a much, uh, much more probability that we find narratively driven works of professional history. Uh, that would be my assumption at the moment. But I really appreciate the question. Okay, great. Um, so there's still Carle, and um, I would also have still a question. So maybe Carle can go first and I post my question. You have the last word. Then, because yes. I think we are, we, maybe we can go on, but yes. I think we should close ah. at 1.2, officially at least. Yes. So I suggest, Carla, you go first, and I pose my question, and then um, Sultan, uh, not Sultan, sorry, um, Wolf has the last word. That is fine. Thanks very much, Wolf. I very much enjoyed that. Just to follow on from your previous point, I think also one, one answer to Zoltan's question would be that we just don't define narrative as narrowly as it's come to be defined in the last 15, 20 years but understand it in the original sense that it encompasses all these others and then you don't even need your triad unless you want to. But I can understand in this present context, that's what you want to do, so I won't contest that. Um, and I also agree about rhetorics and narratology that they can work at different levels of com complexity. So regardless of what you want to call them, I think it, it works very well what you said. So, so I just want to ask a very small technical question just to clarify for myself, I think. Um, for a very good reason, you don't want to talk about the offer. That's well established, and I understand that. But um, and 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 I, I understood what you meant or what you used your term of the text for. But then, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you don't want to use the word narrative and narration, how would your text uh, fall in between or relate to the um, extra diegetic narrator? Would it fall between the author and the extra diegetic narrator or between the extra diegetic narrator and the intra diegetic? <laughs> how, how would you define this in terms of, in the conventional terms of representing these issues? Okay. Um, th th that there, I'm perfectly happy to, um, to rely on your input. Um, I mean, I, I'm aware of, you know, the, I think I'm 
I'm aware of the, the question of where precisely uh, this texter is. I mean, you know, the, the, texter, the texter, in my view, appears in three different fundamentally possibly different roles. I mean, in one book, the texter is a narrator, right? Because the text is a narration, it's primarily advancing narratively, and therefore the instant, the figure that is holding the reins is a narrator. But there are other texts where the texter is then an arguer. And again, other texts where the texter is a describer. And, and therefore, I, I, the texter is, so to speak, the, the, the overall, right? But I would argue any concrete text has inscribed either a narrator or an arguer or a describer, right? As a, as a primary mode of advancement. So that's my, my explanation. And then the text that I had just used to, to summarize these three. And then it's a very good question, where is the text? For my purposes, and here I'm perfectly happy to be enlightened, for my purposes, it's important that it's in the text, right? Uh, because my hypothesis is that actually looking Again, I, I, want to, I want to echo what Joni Mati said. I think it's so important to dive into the text and spend, which I, that, that I have to, that I can claim for myself. I have spent extraordinary amounts of hours reading those long books, right? And you should see my covers, my copies, there are marks all over the place to try to, to determine how is this text advancing? What is the primary mode of advancement? And looking especially at the transitions between chapters and stuff like that. And for me, at the moment, for my hypothesis, trying to indeed to find a kind of meta level that is that can house different perspectives, that has that flexibility and multidirectionality, as I call it. I call it multidirectional, of course, uh, in echo of Michael Rothberg's work. But you know, it, 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 for me, it's important that the text is part of the text, that it's inscribed in the text, and that the close reading makes sense because it allows us to determine the identity of the text in one of the three, right? So in that sense, it's important for me that it's that in the moment, I think it's important to be part of the text. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, that, my, worry, my worry really is that if you have those three positions and you collapse them under one term and you don't, yeah. you're not able to recognize right. the extradiegetic and the intradiegetic narrator, for example, in the same text. And often they can go side by side using different parts uh, of your your free role. Absolutely, but that absolutely, I don't have a, I don't have an answer as yet, and I need to I need to talk to you more about this <laughs> very, very clearly, yeah. very clearly. But you know that was also a question. I mean, just to to confirm that you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the narratologist, uh, Wolf Schmidt, years ago, uh, I, I think he has still the best introduction to narratology and I had the opportunity to talk to him about these ideas a couple, some years ago. And he raised exactly the same question, right? And I didn't have a good answer then, and I'm afraid I don't have a good answer now. <laughs> but I'll, I'll come back to you about that one. We'll talk about that more. Thank and you. I should add that it's a pleasure to see you, Colin. Very good to see you too. Okay, great. Um, well, we're at the end, basically, but I would also still have a question. Are you? Do you have the stamina for that, Wolf? Is that all Absolutely. right? I mean, Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want I'm to sorry. Sort of yeah. go to long on for the rest too. But um, because my question has some sort of some relation to what Carla just suggested too uh, about your triangle, and maybe I want to contend your free um levels or your, your your sort of free corners a bit. Um, I see. I, I somehow can see how argumentation stands apart here, and I, I would I would sort of understand argumentation as the maybe epistemic background work that might also be visible in the text that um, delivers justification for what, what, what else is being in there. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really see how, you, how, how description and narrative are necessarily, or how, 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 they, how they are set apart, how they are two different things. So does that mean in your position that uh, narrative cannot be descriptive? Of, or, or is description something that is a singular statement? Is description something that is like a sentence or something close to a singular statement, therefore it's not a narrative? Um, because at least in my, in, in my um, opinion, and that's a very limited understanding of narrative compared to what Kyle just said, for me, a narrative can be descriptive. A narrative can be a description of a process in the past. So in that sense, it can be descriptive in that mm -hmm. sense. So, um, and that would rest narrative also a bit away from aesthetic questions if you put narrative. So, because you have linked narrative very close to sort of um, aesthetic issues, and that would put narrative closer to the descriptive pole as well. So. Um, and then maybe um, um, related to that, but that's more like a, really on a 
um, that's that on the on the level of what you said on uh, um, analysis of the narratologist. I didn't fully understand that um, description is spatial and narrative is temporal. Can, well, especially understand that narrative is temporal, but what do you mean by description being spatial? Obviously, you don't mean spatial in the sense when I look at the books, there's a sentence and that's a spatial thing. You mean spatial in the sense of, of, of the way it, 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 it portrays, represents the past, of the way it deals with the past? So these are the mm -hmm. two questions. One is more sort of on the specific concept, the other one is on the differentiation between narration and or narrative and description. And then, yeah. please, also in the very end, um, there was the question of if you, if you have any literature on, the, uh, on, the, on this current work of yours yes. generally. Please answer that too. Thank you. Yes. Very good question and very good to probe these uh, because, of course, that's the, that's the very essence of uh, what I'm trying to, to craft. And therefore, I'm also very appreciative and, 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 uh, of, of that help. Um, again, I think the point of departure, and look, and if there's anything to be gained from, from my uh, intervention, um, then perhaps to shift our perspective a little bit. And, and the point of departure is that any, uh, any text, any professional historical text is a hybrid. So, and, and therefore also all three of these perspectives, I would argue have legitimacy. And you can legitimately uh, read a text from any of the three angles. You can, you can because, because there is no historical text that does not at some point, it also deals with change over time, Therefore, there is no historical text that doesn't have narrative components uh, because there is no historical text worth its medal that has not a, a deep uh, empirical epistemological foundation. Therefore, there is no text that does not have significant descriptive ambition. Um, and because there's hardly, there's no text that does not have some kind of argumentative agenda. Uh, therefore, there is no text that does not have also a, a kind of an, an argumentative uh, textual advancement that can be seen in the text. The questions of the relationship, always a question of the relationship and the, the balancing and this, this somewhat tricky task of trying to identify a primary mode of advancement. And here, you're absolutely right. Uh, again, the, the, the non-primary uh, parts, are always there on every page. They are advancing, they are helping, they are tools. But I would see, so in that sense, for example, it's also very clear, the relationship in the description and narration is also very clear that especially on the low level of complexity, that is on a low level of narrative complexity, of course, uh, narratives can be descriptive. Right? And of course, descriptions can be advanced successfully by way of narration. That's why we have to differentiate, and we don't know, we haven't been able to, to really determine where exactly it breaks down, right? Where exactly does the piling up of facts, you know, towards a narrative or an argumentative direction, where does it break down? But it breaks down somewhere. That's, I think, the agreement between both the narrative, narrativists and the post-narrativists, it does break down, right? So uh, in that sense, <clears throat> The, the a text that is descriptively driven is a text that simply doesn't have much of an argumentative or a narrative agenda. And, and let's, let's take for a moment historians at face value that they often don't have, they don't have great aesthetic abilities or, or ambition, right? It's not, they are therefore much closer to a chronology. You know, remember the, the famous passage in White, you know, the beginning of the content or the form or differentiates between a chronicle and a narrative, right? So many historians feel quite comfortable in this. Yeah, our business is the chronicle. Yes, a little bit dressed up, but we are, we are in the business of chronicle. And I would, I would argue that applies to the spirit of, for example, the work of uh, Chris Browning, right? Where, where the, the colligatory concepts, they are often a way, they're often a way of acknowledging the work of colleagues. They're not important in the way that the text is actually uh, structured. Um, so therefore I'm saying, you know, if you have, especially if you have an event like the final solution, where the beginning point and the end point are so clearly defined, yeah, you know, 
that's not the issue, right? You don't make a career by, by arguing the final solution started in 1923. It's nonsense, right? You can't do this. So, so the, the, what the points are so clearly defined and you can't play with the beginning of the end as Hayden has told us is so important for historians. No, you can't do this. Then you are, you are in a kind of a straitjacket um, where the question, for example, of description comes to the comes forth and where then I would say the texts are often advancing spatially. They're advancing spatially because they're looking at the different locations. They, you, can, you can look, if you look at both, um, you look at all three books, um, Chris Browning's, uh, Saul Friedlander's to a lesser extent, but also Raoul Hilberg, it's going from place to place, from going to deportation site to deportation site, from killing center to killing center, going from one location to the other. You can literally say this is the, 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 the work, the text advances, time change over time is not, is not that important. So therefore it's not narratively driven. Not primary, of course, time is there. You know, you can't, you can't engage with this, but that's what I would suggest. And here I would say, it, the historians have not been able to put words to their instincts, right? But their instincts are not altogether wrong. You know, when they say, I'm just describing, you know, I'm just capturing what happened, they have a point. And there are some texts that they produce where that is the primary point. Um, that at least I would like to entertain as a hypothesis, as a possibility. And therefore, the three foldedness, the triangle is for me as a hypothesis at this point is so important because I want to distinguish between three viable positions that are in dialogue with each other and that are also giving historians three clearly different modes of, of writing and, and playing uh, with language and in language. Um, and, and I find that diversity to be an asset rather than a burden. So I don't want to shrink it uh, to argumentation. I mean, also suggest just like there are different levels of argue, different levels of narrative, very low complexity, high complexity. There are very different types of arguments transgressing the historical text. Some of them of the lesser uh, complexity and the higher complexity, I think we also need to differentiate there. And the lesser the complexity of the argument, the closer we are to description. And often the argument is, as I said, with regard to Raoul Hilberg, this happened. My argument is this happened. Of course, it's an argument, but it's an argument that is uh, much, much closer to description than, you know, a, a complex uh, argument. What do we do, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, what do we do vis-a-vis -vis global warming, right? You can write a history about that. That would be much more complex and a much more complex uh, argumentation, I would argue. So I want to differentiate here as well. Does that make sense? Yes, great, Wolf. And now maybe at the very end, where can we read about all this great new <laughs> work of yours? Or what would you recommend? I, 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 have, I have, I mean, because when the invitation came, it was so fabulous because I have a work in progress, an article in progress, where I try precisely for the first time to put this together and also very compact. Uh, but that's not ready yet. The footnotes are missing. Um, and so I have tried this. Uh, I've tried this uh, in an, I, I can show you. Hang on, just get it. Uh, One, one place is, for example, the most advanced, I think we have come closest also identifying the text is this book, Analyzing Historical Narratives, edited by Stefan Berger, Nicola Brauch, and, and Chris Lorenz. Uh, that's my reading of uh, Tim Timothy Snyder. But I try in this, in this essay, you know, long essay, I try to also establish this idea of differentiating between author and text. I try to use Carlotta Smith, you know, the modes of advancement. So this is the closest that I have done. But I have had a couple of close readings and trying to uh, analyze beginning much closer with White. Uh, for instance, a close reading uh, published in, uh, in History and Theory, I think 2009, um, where I, uh, I, I do a close reading of Friedlander's years of extermination from 
Hayden White's point of view, trying to bring the two together. And, and afterwards, I actually organized two conferences where we brought the two together again, because they had never met after, um, after uh, probing the limits. Uh, so there is the piece in history and uh, theory, I think 2009. There is one in another volume I edited, I show it to you. That's a that's the book I co-edited. It's called "Probing the Ethics of Holocaust Culture." You know, in a kind of a, an echo of "Probing the Limits," where I have a, a piece on uh, on a close reading of Christopher Browning, right? And I recently published a close reading of Raoul Hilberg in German. Unfortunately, doesn't exist in in English yet um, in a in a German. Uh, uh, journal but so so i have i have now uh, these the four uh, kind of close readings but the overarching the idea of that triangle the idea of uh, the multidirectionality that is really an idea i only had in the last two years and trying to you know develop that uh, so hopefully i can i can place that type of piece with your encouraging words uh, yoni mati i will try to uh, to uh, write a, a manuscript and, and share it with you before I send it off and you can also uh, see it, how, how compelling or problematic it is. Okay, great. I think this is a very good closing work. Then um, thank you again, Wolf. I thank everybody else of you um, for having been here. Good. Our next talk is in May, Kalle Pichleinen. And finally, um, Wolf agreed to stay on a bit with us now more informally yes. and more informally with us with people of the center. Yeah. Anybody else, please stay on with us and have a chat. Thank you. Bye.